People have always wanted to be able to detect deception, be it in a criminal case or a simple family dispute. Over the years, a set of tools were developed aimed at exactly that, to figure out if someone is telling a lie. These tools and instruments tried to adhere to the scientific method, but with inconsistent results. One such instrument that became the industry standard is the polygraph. But just how reliable is a polygraph at identifying who's lying and who's telling the truth? In the old days, being able to get the truth out of someone relied heavily on torturing the subject and hoping for the best. Over the years and decades, more humane techniques were developed. These techniques focused on physiological factors that could be used as mediators of truth. In the early 20th century, William Moulton Marston, the self-proclaimed father of the polygraph, showed a connection between blood pressure and lying. Basically, tell a lie and your blood pressure rises. In 1921, a physiologist from the University of California, Berkeley, named John Larson, took the polygraph a step further. He combined the measurements of both blood pressure and breathing. The new test looked at spikes and drops in breathing rate. The Berkeley Police Department later adopted his device and used it on witnesses to assess their credibility. In 1939, Larson's student, Leonard Keeler, updated the system. He made it portable and ready for travel and added a new feature that measures sweat gland activity that could show the intensity of an emotional state. His device was later purchased by the FBI and was the precursor to the modern polygraph. Later versions were variations on this original. Today, a lie detector is a general term, but it usually refers to a polygraph. A polygraph is a system that monitors multiple physiological responses, such as heart and breathing rate, blood pressure, and sweating, and graphs them out visually for an examiner to analyze. There are two ways to conduct a polygraph. The first is called controlled question technique, where the examiner will ask irrelevant questions, as well as control and relevant questions. Then, he compares the results and checks if the subject's physiological responses change from response to relevant questions. The idea is, because lying induces so much stress, it will be visible in the measurements being taken. For example, increased sweating and elevated heart rate. The second approach is known as the guilty knowledge test. It tests any knowledge of events, not just guilty knowledge. The examiner measures a subject's response to specific questions in an attempt to determine whether the subject does in fact have personal knowledge of an event. This could be anything from knowing how many times a victim was stabbed to the color of the getaway car. Presumably, a person who lacks knowledge of an event would not react significantly differently to the accurate answer because he or she wouldn't know what's right and what's not. Meanwhile, so the logic goes, a person who has first-hand knowledge would demonstrate a physiological response. Of course, this method also has inherent limitations regarding, among other things, what types of questions are being asked. The effectiveness of polygraphs is a contested area in scientific and legal communities. In 2002, a review by the National Research Council found that specific incident polygraph tests can detect lying from truth-telling at rates well above chance, though well below perfection. The NRC warned against using polygraphs to screen potential employees, but it did note that specific incident polygraph tests yield more accurate results in the field. It seems targeted relevant questions conducted by a well-trained individual seem to work better in unmasking the truth. Polygraphs can also deliver false positives, asserting that someone is lying who is actually telling the truth. The consequences of failing a polygraph can be serious, from not getting a job to being labeled a serial killer. In the 1998 Supreme Court case, United States v. Schaefer, the majority stated that unlike other expert witnesses who testify about factual matters outside the juror's knowledge, such as the analysis of fingerprints, ballistics, or DNA found at a crime scene, a polygraph expert can supply the jury only with another opinion. In 2005, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals reiterated that polygraph did not enjoy general acceptance from the scientific community. Polygraphs are generally inadmissible in any criminal case because the readings registered by a polygraph machine can be affected by many factors, including the subject's nervousness in an intense situation, which could give the impression that the subject is lying. In short, polygraphs may offer some, albeit slight, confidence that a person is telling the truth about a particular incident. Studies have shown that when a well-trained examiner uses a polygraph, he or she can detect lying with relative accuracy. But a polygraph is not perfect. An examiner's interpretation is subjective and there's no 100% reliable physical sign of telling a lie.
Under the right circumstances, the polygraph allegedly can be fooled by a trained individual, 